Hi, welcome back to the Untold Stories. As always, bringing you exclusive interviews with your favorite sports personality. And today is going to be quite different because I will be interacting with one man that I've actually really looked up to in this profession. He is, I don't know if I should refer to him as a former sports journalist, but he is a veteran sports journalist. Currently, he has deviated a little bit. Currently, the general manager for Dekitao, I mean Dekitao, with Media General, and he has worked with most of the major media houses in the world, from BBC to Super Sports, just name it. And so, I will be unveiling my guest shortly after this quick break. Welcome to On Two Stories. Thank you, Betty, and, and thanks for having me. I, I believe you, you've heard a lot of things about yourself. There are so many things. Before I even got to know you, I mean, aside your work, of the field, there are certain things I also heard about you. I understand uh, OTJ is not really friendly. He is a bit anti so and all that. How would you describe yourself? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am, um, I don't know. I am a very reserved person. I'm a reserved person. I like to keep within my circles. Everybody who studied with me in Pope John knows this. Uh, but I'm also a man full of opinions. I, I just happen to understand better than a lot of people do that you don't need to speak your opinions every time, that you need to watch the circle where you speak the opinions to. Uh, I'm a fiercely loyal person. You can tell in the places that I've worked and how committed I've stayed through, through to that. I was a BBC correspondent for 15 straight years. I've been showing up at TV3 literally every day of my life. So you confirm the fact that you're antisocial? I am. Okay. I mean, I, and I cannot wait as a badge of honor. I don't think that my, my time is best spent hanging out and all that. When I was growing up, um, Christmas was the best period when I could do my, mm. my assignment from GIJ, and there were assignments I scored great marks for. I'm not going to change that for anything. Um, I find that sometimes not going out on a friday sometimes is the best decision i make <laughs> it doesn't mean but you also speak to some of my closest friends and they will laugh at the thought that i am supposed to be antisocial how is your day like typically when you go to the office just run me through your um, day as a general manager so i've i've worked through a lot of motions first of all i think your day is influenced by your work ethic and my work ethic is, I would like to think, a pretty strong one. Um, uh, I've met journalism students and said that lawyers take their job seriously, doctors do. When a lawyer is going to adjudicate a case, the element of research that goes into it is impeccable. That's always been my attitude. Uh, I have a fondness for law. I. So in the days when I used to write for Africa Sports, and it's a habit that's followed me, I take, for me, the most important part of the day is how you start. Mm. By four, I would, uh, whether in my capacity in the past as digital general manager, group head of sports, or now as news, I'll review a lot of the things concerning my area, my competitors. So between four and about 5.30, I want to. I want to be abreast with everything that happened. I want to understand. I want to understand what Onia News missed. I want to understand what TV3 News missed. I want to understand what 3FM News didn't get right. I want to understand how it feeds into anything. If I am overlooking our Twitter, our Facebook, our YouTube pages, I want to understand which videos did well, we didn't do well. I want to understand the analytics. I want to be abreast with the insight. Mm. I want to walk into the 8 a.m. meetings. Uh, uh, you know, and, and be, be absolutely sure that I am prepared for the day. You, you seem to be a man of perfection. You always want things to be done right and put in a lot of work. Is it difficult working under you? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't think so. Look, I might look at perfection in a simple way. I watched a movie that said uh, perfection is a necessary goal even if it's unattainable. And that because it's unattainable, it's actually the exact reason why you do it. You do it because that's when you just get close to mm. the best thing. Yeah, people have had difficulties working under me, I'm not going to lie. Um, people 
you think that I'm a bit too demanding, I will call you at 4 a.m. if I, I need something. Um, I'm not a man who praises easily. It's a bit of work for me. I've covered the World Alizzi Championship twice for the BBC. I covered the World Cup. I've covered Nations Cups. I've joined in live into a lot of foreign media houses. I've written articles, and I know the standards that makes those media houses the best. And I think, sadly, too many times, journalists in Ghana sort of think that it's OK to drop the standard here. Part of my job in my leadership in any media house is to constantly remind people that. But also, you have to understand, nobody leads a news team, a team of creatives, digital, sports, and the rest. And it's popular. Mm. It barely happens. Would you ever see you come back to sports journalism? I have not left sports journalism. I still do articles. I, I did a few things with YouTube. But I've said several times that you sometimes you have to evolve. Mm. Um, if there were opportunities in sports journalism that match my personal ambitions, now I would do it. But I want to be a bit broader than that. I want to be engaged at the executive level of, level of media. My inspiration for wanting to be in that space was because I thought that people who practice journalism at the highest level should be central in managing it at the highest level. It always doesn't work that way. It means that as journalists, we prepare ourselves well, we read the right material, we understand the basic principles of management, we understand the importance of costs, or otherwise we understand the business decisions and not just engrossed in wanting to put stuff on TV and mm. all that. And, and those are things that I think I've prepared myself well for. And if sports affords me the opportunity, then I would do it. But I don't want to go back to being the guy holding a microphone waiting for four hours at the airport <laughs> for a player. Okay. But I mean, but I don't want to do it again. You don't want to do it again. Mm -hmm. But I mean, with regards to then, when you were with your crop of journalists, yeah. and now, I... without mincing with words, I mean, how would you compare the two generations? Do you think that sports journalism? has improved or it has actually, the, the standard has fallen. You know, I think there's always a bit of nostalgia for people of a certain age. So, uh, everybody talks about how their generation was better and, and <laughs> all that. And uh, I don't think that the quality of sports journalism has gone down. I have to be honest with you. I think it can be better. I think it can improve. I think that people who follow sports have a more varied a richer vein of people to pick from. So things have changed. Mm -hmm. I also see the quality of work that the likes of Gary does on international platforms. Or you look at the articles that they are also be writing and all that. So I think that there is enough quality. Do I think that there is as much depth? I am not sure. But I think that we also exaggerate how good sports journalism was in the past. Mm -hmm. I have to be honest with you. I spoke about match reports that were flat and straight to the point. It wasn't, it, it, it's not something of Extraordinary. Today. Yes. Now, what is that one major challenge that you faced personally in your line of duty as a sports journalist? I think there's a, um, there are two things. There's a lack of respect for the profession. So, you know, right from the start, when I see parents, your friends, you go into certain circles and you can tell that people look at you. Why, why are you doing sports journalism? Do you face that? Yes, it's, it's, it's regular. I was in journalism school with people whose parents were not talking to them again because they decided to do journalism. Mm -hmm. Have you but ever been beaten before? No, okay. no. But I also think there's something else we don't talk enough about, that media houses don't take the responsibility of grooming and training their journalists properly. Mm. So if I sign up to the BBC and I was have a requisite training in journalism, I will still go through a BJ1, BJ2 that, that literally goes me from the start. You know, here, they will take somebody from somewhere out of journalism school, throw him onto the radio station the first day, no proper onboarding, no understanding of the house style. They don't even tell you what to do. That's why people come on radio on Sunday. There's a league game at the Accra Sports Stadium. They are on air, and because they've not been told and they've not practiced this over a period, the first question, the standard practices you come to you. Tell us what's happening at the Accra Sports Stadium. Everybody knows standard practice. You watch anything, your first thing. You're stating the most important facts mm -hmm. of the moment. 
here at the Accra Sports Stadium has a focus up by two goals to one. ABC scored a goal, EMGH did that. It's been an interesting game. Lots of chances for the opposition, but has looked very strong. They are leading by two goals to one at the moment because you're starting with the most important fact. You are wrapping up with the most important fact and you are putting the minor details in the middle. But in Ghana, you hear people come on and say, Sure, you know, do you see what I have? <laughs> By, by the time they would have finished with setting the scene, you want to turn the radio off. Mm -hmm. And this is not just street journalists, so I'm sorry I used she as an example, but I hear a lot of people, whether English, she and the rest, who are winding around the subject. No sense of agency, no understanding that radio is important to people, no understanding that in radio, when you switch over to somebody, you're changing, and the, the next person you're switching over to needs to have an almost uncanny ability to pick off the conversation mm. almost quickly without dropping the interest and by the time you finish it's all gone so, so i think media houses have a, bit, a lot to do in terms of training and, and i really hope that they would step it up mm. now what do you make of female sports journalists i mean the current crop of women that are in the field as sports journalists what do you make of their input i think it's been interesting i've i've seen the the development of a lot of female sports journalists. So there are a lot of people who have the capacity, who are good and have the capacity to become even better. And I really hope that the system will continue to allow them to grow. I think that the tolerance and the capacity and the opportunities for female sports journalists has become much, much better than it's ever been. Juliet Hedda was group head of sports and media general and did an amazing job. The quality of production during the World Cup was, was impeccable. The leadership of the team, the content, the output and everything was great. And you see that every day with female sports journalists. And my advice to female sports journalists, be like we the stubborn guys. You don't listen to the things people say. You don't care. You know, you may care. You go home and you go into your room and you think about it. But ultimately, people will judge you by what you put out. And whilst a lot of the rest, sometimes you need to make a stand on principle and the rest. But I think that female sports journalists have earned their place. And I hope that they will be given, they will continue to be given the required respect for them. Now, let's talk about football. Because, I mean, that's one of the most loved. It is the most loved, not one of mm -hmm. the, the most loved sports in Ghana. And the... I mean, in recent years, it seems uh, various national teams have not really performed greatly at the various international tournaments. And there are some that believe that Ghana is no more the football <laughs> nation. Some are even saying that it's on life support. But just to you, what is the current state of Ghana football? How would you describe the current state of Ghana football? I think you have a state of football where individuals are thriving and the sport generally is not. So mm. more players are moving, you saw Kamadin, the footballers are making money, you know, the transfer system has become liberalized. In the past, everybody had to take their players to Liberty Professional, but they could travel outside. Now Division Two clubs have access to big time connections. And I think the transfer system is also part of the reason we are having these issues. I think we are in times that requires a bit more in-depth thinking than we are getting now. So we need a bit more in terms of how we would promote the domestic game i think it has to be better exposure on tv you have to take swallow the pill and maybe liberalize how live football scheduled and the rest to compete mm. with the influx of material from outside and how to effectively use social media platforms in the rest to do that how would you reach the administration of the ghana football association Hi. <laughs> on a scale of one to ten if I do one to ten, I will lose a lot of friends. <laughs> but it's obvious from the tournament situations that, in that regard, we've been very poor. There's it's no other way of putting it. You mean the administration my, has been yeah, poor? My old journalism schoolmate, Kat. Look, you have the Nations Cup. Group stage exit. That had not happened for God knows how long. I bought the decision to bring back Milovan Raivat on reflection poor decision and sometimes that's why people say we journalists are to blame because i was so sure that he would do a good job um the world cup was was nothing to write home about i like there are things that the administration has got right 
the country on refereeing policy. I think that the administration is very strong on branding and getting things done. The coaching courses has be, have become more liberalized, which means that you have a lot more to. There is a lot of focus on juvenile football, which is which is great. All these things are great, but Ket has to realize that if the national teams don't do well, all these things will mean nothing. Mm. I think maybe in the coming days, a new Black Stars coach will be named. And I mean, you have been very, very influential when it comes to giving advice to the right. FA. Yeah, you have. <laughs> I mean, with, with regards to the Milo comeback, I think you were. Yeah, I was just speaking very, opinion, you know. <laughs> yeah, you are very prominent in some of the opinions opinion. that you shared. But if we were to go for any coach, I mean, there's been the talk of. Um, the, is it the technical advisor? Chris. Or Chris, yeah, Chris Hilton, managing the affairs of the senior national team. Is, is he someone that you think we should go for? Well, I think you have to balance it on a lot of things. Somebody who knows the team, somebody with pedigree, I think. So I spent about an hour with him when he was here. Uh, and he seemed to be somebody who knew his, you know, who was pretty familiar with this country, knew the players. I think, look, if you're managing the Premier League, if you spend time with the players, you can do it. I think it's obvious to us now that the quality for the, the, the range for measuring what we can do, the coach has gone away from just who has coached at one level. <laughs> it's also as important who has the bottle to be able to withstand all the influences that comes with the team. I hear people say that the first point is to stop the GFA from interfering. You can't. Mm, it will continue. There are people who are human. It's been there since God knows how long. Booker Caesar famously sacked the sports minister. 80 minutes are from the dressing room back then. <laughs> this is something that's always been there. But you must find coaches who are able to say, this is why I draw the line. I manage news. It should be okay for my boss to say, do A, B, C, D. This is how I think we should do it. At the end of the day, I should be able to say, having assessed everything, this is how I think it should go. And then you're giving the backing to prove whether you can do it or not. So we must find somebody with the capacity to be able to absorb all these things, listen to everything and say, I make the final call. That's what Kwesi Apia had. That's what I think potentially Chris Hutin will have. Whoever gets the job, and I am not fast about who does uh, so long as it's not what to add because I think that he was a complete disaster for I us. I think you, you, you were very disappointed in him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was a, was a big auto fan. <laughs> Look, we used to go and wait at Boomerang just to catch a glimpse <laughs> of photo. Do you know Boomerang the nightclub? Just to catch a glimpse of him. He was so famous back then. You know, just a few games for the national team. I just didn't like his body language with the national team. Mm. I hate it when people coach us and they come across as doing us a favor. And I think that's what we told it. But I think that anybody and i had the same issue at some point at some point ram grant became very good friends with me but i was asking very tough questions of him so whichever coach comes must realize that this is our lifeblood this means everything to us do you agree to the school of thoughts that believe that sports journalists are the cause of <laughs> the ghana premier league not developing it's absolute nonsense <laughs> <laughs> it's absolute nonsense I mean, I don't know why anybody says that. I think the, the I mean, sports journalists bad mouth the league. No. That's why many what fans are not... What do sports journalists do? Do sports journalists cook up referee bribery? You know? Mm. Do sports journalists... Are sports journalists the ones who are not showing up for pretty much interviews? No? Are sports journalists the ones who are giving some of the worst calls? Or are they the ones running onto the field to go and beat anybody. We always tackle the problems the wrong way. Mm. Um, I hear that and I always laugh. Um, does anybody think that if, when fans, what did they do? Okay, so maybe we could pick a few lessons from when a streaker walks onto the pitch in a major international game. They don't give the spotlight there. I don't know whether that's what they're saying. But when our football officials say that they're asking us to turn a blind eye to blatant corruption, to blatant incompetence. Um, they're asking us not to say things. I admit that some of us go overboard. Some of the description of the league is a problem. Um, that there's not enough balance in the way we do things. But it's absolute nonsense that we give our money, we give our time, we give mm -hmm. our resources to somebody to manage a product. 
they don't have a proper media plan for it they don't have a proper promotional plan for it they don't be there's watching a one themselves. million dollar that's supposed to promote the league yes you know there are too many things people don't do and then they are de facto mode is to say that the only reason people don't watch their league is because you speak about it i'll give you a simple example maybe on this weekend if i bring my small boy over home mm. and i could say to him yes that we are going to watch a lot of things today i could have that blue dstv remote control in my hand and we will walk through give and take by the time sunday night is over i would have walked through about 15 live games from anywhere in the world, mm. from Turkey, from Netherlands, from England, from Spain, and, and across the board. What is the management of the league doing to ensure that somebody like me or my son gets off his couch? Are they making it easy for me to watch it on my phone, mm. on the TV? Are they giving me a family experience at the stadium? Are there tent posts to ensure that people go to the stadium? Or people are going to go to the stadium and they're not going to find their seats they're going to argue with people all over they're going to spend hours at the gate look what happens when people try and go and watch high school games yeah i have people who want to replica jerseys of the biggest clubs in Ghana. they can't find anywhere to buy well anyway if you have one advice for kids what would that be i would say don't take the criticisms personal he does Sometimes I get a feeling that it gets to him. He's a passionate man, so you can understand. Um, some of the criticism as well, it can't hurt. Uh, some of it has made him to look like a man who has just set out to enrich himself at the expense of Ghana football. And I know that sort of thing can hurt. I'm not sure that's Kate's personality. I don't think that's who he is. I think that he genuinely cares about Ghana football. I've known him long enough from our journalism school days when he used to be uh, on scores on the board on Joy FM and used to do stuff at Radio Gold and the rest. He set out for a very long time. He's built a product that's very strong. Dreams FC. I knew him when he was working with Alaji Bimbo at uh, Mamu B Youth. He's done amazing things that a lot of people don't talk about. My plea with him is not to allow the intensity of the pressure he wrote. A lot of the very, very good things that he's done. Look, what Kate built at Dreams FC, the players and the lives that he's changing and everything. The sample evidence of a man who can do things right. What he needs to understand is that when people like Sadiq and, and the rest, uh, and Gary and the rest speak about their ills in football, we are aiming for one end goal. All of us understand the impact of a good product that is IE Ghana football, whether the product is the Premier League or whether the product is the Black Stars, or the Meteors, or the Black Galaxies, or the under 17, or the under 20. All of us are passionate. Do you ever allow Yao to be a sports journalist? No. <laughs> Why? Because the industry doesn't pay? Yes, one. <laughs> um, two, so even myself, I don't think that if I had to choose a profession again, I would choose sports journalism. Really? No. I would... You regret being one? No, I don't regret. I don't, I don't regret. You're here in my house. It's not a mansion, but I'm fairly comfortable in life. Um, I've earned well from this profession. I've traveled to places I didn't think I would ever. I've met people. I've built a strong reputation. Sports journalism is the reason why I have been elevated to a general manager at Media General. And I'm a happy person. I've worked for some of the biggest organizations. Uh, I go into places and people shake my hands uh, from the period when I did sports journalism. But if I had another chance, having been in this for a very long time has taught me that I did sports journalism because I had a big interest in football. I have learned that I have grown up rapidly since then that you can have a big interest in football and maybe do more impactful professions. A top marketing executive maybe, maybe will pay more. I'm just, I'm, I'm just a bit more logical. Mm. A lot of the things I knew, you know, so I could be a very good lawyer and be a top agent. I could be a very, very good lawyer 
and be a very, very good lawyer for a lot of footballers, and that will still retain my interest in sports journalism. So no, I will not stop you from developing a big interest in, in sports. I think that sports is one of the best things you can have. It makes you analytical, it makes you sharp, it builds your social skills. It teaches you teamwork in the manner that nothing does. A lot of my principles of managing news teams and the rest, it derives from watching sports teams and the way they operate and the sort of leadership styles that they have. But no, I want my son to be an engineer, a doctor, a, a lawyer. I want him to become a software developer like my junior brother is. Something along those lines. And then if by chance we can use that skill to build sports capacity, we'll do it. But okay. no. My son is not going to be a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> when you are out of work, when you are not doing sports, when you are not reading news, when you are not doing anything related to work, what do you do at your, I mean, during your leisure time? Um, I used to be a gym freak, but I've become fat now. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I love a swim. I am uh, I'm a big fan of series. Just been, I just posted on Facebook how I finished watching Kaleidoscope <laughs> or something. And I had to watch it multiple times to figure it out. I like watching a good movie. I like watching a good series. I just like staying at home. It's there, nice and easy. There is a story I read online about you. And I want to ask you to end. <laughs> I want to end on that note. I read that you said you never want to get married. Is that <laughs> <it>? <laughs> I don't know if I said that. I said that when I was growing up. It wasn't a top priority. It's still not a priority now. Um, I don't know. Mine's changed. Maybe it will change. But I said to Nanaba, and I'm saying this to you, that when I wake up and I, I'm planning the things I'm going to do, that's Mary not one of doesn't fall in. No. Wow. No. I mean, I understand that people like it. Good luck to them. <laughs> <laughs> but I know you have a lot of admirers. Yes, it's normal. Um, and there are people I admire too. Okay. You know, there are a lot of people I admire. But you can, you can have admirers, you can admire people. You can get all the benefits from it. You don't have to be married to do that. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So this is where we draw the curtains on today's episode of the Untold Stories. I believe you enjoy the conversations. My name is Betty Yosin. Catch you in our next episode.